Cineculture. Um, for those of you who might be joining for the first time, I'm the Cineculture Advisor. Okay. Yeah, I just I'm figured muted. that out. I just figured that out. Thank you very much. So welcome to Cineculture. I'm Mary Hussein, Cineculture Advisor and Instructor, and I'd like to thank you very much for joining us tonight. And for those of you who might be joining for the first time, Cineculture is a film series provided as a service to the community. It's also a campus club and is an academic course in the MCJ department. So um, particularly students, if you're looking for a class to fulfill your multicultural degree requirement, um, it will be taught in the fall uh, on an in-person basis. And you're also welcome to join us for screenings in the fall as a community member once you've graduated from this class. I'd like to thank uh, the sponsor this evening, Armenian Studies Program, in particular, um, the director, Professor Barlow de Mergadichian, who I'll be introducing momentarily. Um, a few announcements about upcoming films. Next week, we'll be screening I'll Meet You There, which is a Pakistani-American film. The director will be joining us. Then April 28th, we'll have a Pakistani shorts film program with four directors. Then on May the 5th, Like Father, Like Son, um, with Dr. Ed Emanuel, we'll, we'll be discussing this Japanese language film. And then calmly with the director joining us from Lahore, Pakistan. So it's my great honor at this point to introduce um, Barlow, Professor Barlow Dermurgadichian. I'm delighted to continue Cineculture's longtime collaboration with Armenian Studies. Fifteen years ago, when I became Cineculture Advisor and Instructor, I reached out to him and we have been working together to bring Armenian-themed films to our community ever since. Professor Demergadichian is the Barbarian Coordinator of the Armenian Studies Program. He teaches a variety of courses in the program, including language, art, history, and literature. And I just found out he's taking students once again to Armenia this summer. Professor Demergadichian's dedication and tireless efforts to bring a wide range of Armenian theme events to Fresno is truly phenomenal. Please joining me in welcoming Professor Demergadichian, who will introduce our guest director, Vic Germani. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hussein, for that introduction. And it is uh, indeed a pleasure on uh, the behalf of the Armenian Studies Program to always sponsor programs with Cineculture. They have been so successful, I believe, in bringing uh, Armenian culture to this community, to this diverse community. So I want to thank you again for our cooperation. Uh, for those past, it's hard to believe 15 years now that we've been working together, but we have really screened just some wonderful films on a variety of topics, uh, both uh, artistic films, documentaries, and, and all other types of films. Uh, tonight, I'd like to just briefly mention uh, one upcoming event that we, we have at the Armenian Studies Program. I'm going to go ahead and just share the screen very briefly. Uh, you should be able to see it's, it's a upcoming event, which is actually happening uh, tomorrow night at uh, 7 p.m. That's Saturday, April the 15th. Then our speaker is going to be Dr. Christina Moranci. She's coming from Harvard University. She is the Mashtos Professor of Armenian Studies. And her talk is going to be on Armenian art, current directions, and future goals. And uh, this will take place at the Smith Camp Alumni House on campus. And if you can make it between six and seven, uh, we're gonna have a reception with some food and then followed by this presentation, which is actually going to be the first in a series of uh, lectures uh, sponsored by the Grace and Paul Shahinian uh, family uh, in the series of Armenian Christian art series. So we're going to have this uh, one, one, art, uh, one art lecture per each uh, semester. And so it's really going to be very exciting uh, that we're here. So if any of the students can make that and any of our guests, that would be great. Uh, I'm going to make Vic a little bit bigger here. So it's my pleasure tonight to introduce the director and producer of the film Motherland, which uh, we were able to screen this week. Vic Jaramie is an award-winning uh, journalist and editor and publisher of The Blunt Post. Uh, he is also the host and co-producer of a national headline news and politics program called The Blunt Post uh, with Vic on KPFK 90.7, that's the Pacifica Network. And uh, also he is, his radio program, uh, TBPV, covers national, regional, 
and local headline news, politics, and current events, where he offers analysis and, and commentary. And I got involved in the film through his outreach when Vic contacted me and asked uh, me some questions and interviews. I was very happy to see that the film was uh, produced and has received a quite a, uh, a quite a lot of attention, both nationally and internationally. Uh, the Wall Street Journal has featured uh, Vic as a leading gay activist in its landmark 2008 coverage in the opposition to Proposition 8, uh, the ballot measure that for years denied same-sex couples in California the freedom to marry. In addition, he has uh, years of volunteer work as a leading advocate for marriage equality, and he served as a planning committee member for the historic Resist March in 2017. So tonight, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome on behalf of Cineculture, our director, uh, Vic Jarami, to say a few words, and then I'll hand it back to um, Dr. Hussein to, to manage and to moderate today's discussion. Vic, welcome to Cineculture and to Fresno. Thank you, Dr. Dermakarsichian and Dr. Uh, Hussein. It's really um, good to be with you. Fresno has a special place in the heart of uh, Armenians, whether we're Armenian Americans or not. Uh, it's uh, some of us call it Little Armenia because of, you know, it was the first, um, it was the first refuge, if you will, that Armenians uh, started coming to even before the genocide, after some of the massacres uh, that were sort of foreshadowed the Armenian genocide. So good to be with you. Um, thank you for the introduction. I'm, I'm glad that you know, I'm ready for your questions and feedback and uh, yeah, just uh, tell me or ask me whatever you like. Great. And and I, before we do that, I have a question for uh, Professor Demergadichian. I know in the past um, we had the only uh, genocide commemoration monument in the United States and hopefully there are more universities that have those, but are we still the only one or are there more? Still the only uh, state university that has it. Uh, okay. in, in Arizona, Scottsdale Community College, which is on American Indian land, uh, does have a, a, a genocide memorial. Uh, but mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a university, we're the only still the only university that has a genocide monument on its, uh, on its campus. And let me bother you with one more question for an announcement. Will there be a, I, I assume there will be a, a commemoration at the monument that students could attend if they, if they would like to? Um, yes, thank you for uh, reminding me that the Armenian Students Organization will be holding uh, a commemorative event between 10.30 and 1 o'clock, 1 p.m. on Monday, April 24th and students on campus who want to walk by and place flowers in the Armenian Genocide uh, Monument are welcome to do so. We will provide the flowers and information. And then actually later that evening at 7 p.m. Uh, at the monument, the Armenian community of the San Joaquin Valley will commemorate uh, the Armenian Genocide with a religious service, followed by um, a speech uh, presentation by Fresno State President Dr. Saul Jimenez Sandoval, and our keynote speaker, who's an international lawyer, uh, Karni Kirkonian, who's been an advocate for um, advocate for Artsakh and Armenia and in the Armenian Genocide. So it will be a very interesting event at night as well. That's both of those events are on April 24th. And, and if I'm, I assume students probably know where the commemoration, the memorial is, but if not, they might not have known what that what it is. Can you tell them exactly where it is? Located. So when you uh, when you enter campus, if you park at uh, parking lot P5 or 6, which is near the Peters Business Building or the Conley Art Building, the main pathway to the library, which is our main east-west axis, if you're taking that and you're walking towards uh, the center of campus, free speech area, you'll get to the uh, monument right after you pass the Peters Business Building. So it's a very easily seen uh, monument. Uh, and it's kind of in the middle of that pathway from uh, Peters all the way over to the library. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. So um, I'm looking at the at the questions here. Um, David Blake, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Great. All right. So my question is, why well, note like something that really stood out to me in the film is the explicit content that was shown like because seeing other films and footage of let's say the war in ukraine or the holocaust 
they don't really show such like content like you did like they say but you show footage of people literally getting their heads like cut off and say like in other films there's uh, stuff more just uh they get shot and it's done so i'm wondering for this is what was your thoughts on bringing the footage like footage of such explicit content in the film and was there a personal message behind it well um as this is is an investigative film uh, from a journalist's point of view, uh, and because of the fact that this this genocide happened and continues to happen today as we speak in real time, and the lack of media coverage, when I was putting the film together, um, I had to balance uh, between sort of not getting too graphic and scaring people or turning people up, but also showing people the reality, the truth, that this isn't medieval England. This isn't fourth century. This is 2020, when mercenaries from Pakistan, Libya, and Syria are paid 2000 a month to kill Armenians and a $100 bonus to for every severed head they bring back. Where they, where they severed the head of an Armenian living person. So I, I wanted people to see a little bit of that. And I also wanted, uh, and if you really add all of it up, it's maybe about 40 seconds. It just seems longer. Uh, I did want people to leave the theater just a bit disturbed because it's disturbing and it's reality. Thank you very much. Um, Caleb, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for making this film. Um, and my question is, uh, what was involved in the making of the script for this film? Uh, it, primarily in the sense of informing those who haven't been either living through or following this continuation of the genocide for the past three years. Sure, good question. So the the writing of it involved... Uh, first, you know, I had to put the structure, the bones of the film together and say, there's so many different things that I can talk about that has to do with this invasion in 2020, but I only have a limited um, time. So what are the main points that I want to discuss, right? And they were, as you saw in the film, the buildup, how they prepared the lack of media coverage, international com- communities, failure, and so on and so forth. So then I had to uh, take all of these elements. And a lot of it was in my head because I'd lived this from day one when the invasion happened on September 27, 2020. I have literally lived it 14, 15 hours a day um, on Twitter, on social media, on everything. And so um, it was... Uh, really pulling it all together and some of the stuff that I knew in my head to um, really go back and research it and make sure that uh, the dates are right, the numbers are right. This is a film that I knew I would be very, you know, that I would risk being scrutinized if a tiny little number was incorrect. So I can back this film all the way to the Supreme Court uh, because uh, I have the sources, I have the evidence, I have Everything, every claim, every video, every interview is backed. Um, So that was part of that. And then the other part was, um, you know, the actual having a story, right? Because a film, for the lack of a better word, has to be entertaining. And I I made this film for non-Armenians, essentially. And so I had to um, think about several things, how the script was going to go. One. My audience was uh, someone who was didn't know where Artsakh was, probably had never heard of it, maybe didn't even know how to like find Armenia on the map. How do I take that? First of all, how do I capture them in the first two minutes of the film? Keep them entertained and have them walk through it without knowing anything about this, what I call the second most complicated conflict in the world. Um, so there was a lot of that involved. And then also going back to double, triple checking uh, every single thing, uh, incorporating the interviews. Uh, all, everyone that I'd interviewed, um, of course, you know, all the 
bring them in, bring them in the fold. Um, and, uh, you know, the first draft was very long. It was very heavy. Uh, the film itself is very information heavy. It's very dense. But, but the first version was even more so. So we had to cut, cut, cut. There was a lot of cut involved. I hope I answered that. Yes, perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Carla, uh, this is really related. So do you want to ask your question in the context of what our director just shared with us, Carla? Yeah, um, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. Um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Good idea. Um, I'm also a filmmaker. Like I'm barely getting started, but I really I liked your film and you know it's good to see people who are doing what I want to do. But um from my understanding, like in the documentary classes I've taken, a lot of documentaries get foam formed in post-production. So like editing and stuff. And I noticed yours is is um has heavy narration. So I'm guessing a lot of it took part in post-production. Like what do you have to add, what do you sorry? What would you say about post-production when it comes to documentary storytelling? Yeah, you nailed it. It it happens in post production. You know, we I had ton of interviews. I interviewed nine members of Congress. The so two were cut uh, because of lack of. I mean, it was too long. The film was too long, and we had forty three hours of footage, invasion footage, all that br brutal, gruesome stuff that you saw it was 43 hours of that we had to go through my editor and i so my editor chris and i sat uh next to each other for about seven months almost every day and cut this film so a lot of it was um was done uh during editing of making the film cohesive making it um fast paced you know making it uh so it's not very didactic, but also making it so the film uh, is very comprehensive in covering uh, the different elements of this. And it's not just two hours of misery. Um, Post-production was the most complicated and the most expensive part of uh, making this film. Uh, but it was fun. You know, it really was fun. Uh, uh, if I can use that word for this, but it was... Uh, it was great because my, my editor and I, and I think this is rare, we're so on the same page that we, a lot of times we didn't have to say anything. <laughs> we knew what we needed to tweak or change and things like that. So yeah, this post-production is everything in this. I, I just have a comment myself that because the, because of the content, this must have been extremely emotionally at times very difficult for you. I, I've personally interviewed people on around difficult topics and sometimes the weight of that can be so heavy on your heart so I you know how yeah. did you how did you how did how have you managed that I don't know you know the the sad reality is is that Armenians have not exhaled for over two and a half years since September 27 uh, 2020 we've been getting hit I mean as we speak as most of you know, uh, Azerbaijan has held hostage 120,000 Armenians of Artsakh since December 12th uh, without food or medicine going in, uh, cutting off their heat, their electricity, their internet, uh, trying to push them. Um, that's basically ethnic cleansing Artsakh of the Armenians. So, you know, the it, this wasn't just some, it's one thing if you make a film about the Armenian genocide, of 1915, it happened over there. But as as I was making this and we were working on it, I'm also a journalist and I'm an activist, so I'm living it on a different level. On you know, every morning you wake up to something, some new bad news. Uh, it's um, it's frustrating. You know, I've had uh, several 3 a.m. smoke is coming out of my ears frustration don't know what else I can do feel powerless uh, I always joke and say thank god I'm on antidepressants um, or I say you know if I wasn't on antidepressants I would cry uh, my editor cried a lot um, uh, 
going through the, the footage. Um, and the footage that we had was from uh, kind of a underground uh, media person uh, that was, when, when it was happening, I was, I was seeing it like three, four hours later. They're, they were sending it to me. Uh, and then uh, when, the, when they realized I was making the film, they gave me access to all of it. So it's very difficult. It's still very difficult. Um, you know, just a, just a couple of days ago, uh, four Armenians were shot dead from across, you know, from uh, Azerbaijan invading uh, sovereign uh, Armenia. It's, it's just, it's, it's, I can't explain it. I mean, uh, you know, there's no sugar coating it. This Ar Armenian genocide has resumed. It's resumed and uh, it's, uh, and that's what we're going through. And yet we still can't get um, the, the, the world to pay attention, the media to pay attention. So, um, yeah. Thank you. I I was I appreciate your care in answering that question. It's an ongoing struggle, um, it seems, and because of these, it's continuing. So I, I'm um, I commend your efforts, and it takes a lot of courage and and moral and emotional fortitude to continue. But it seems like you have a, your overarching goal is to raise awareness in the world, yeah. and tell the Armenian story. Um, so thank you very much. Let's see, Carla, did you have a different, let's see, did you type a different question or did we, we, did we already, I'm looking at the chat. I believe we, did we talk about, we talked about your question, I believe. Yeah, I, I just asked. It. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Jen Wei, uh, would you like to ask your question? Um, yeah, actually this question is, um, I as for most of us. So as the, when the wars happen in other countries, what should the uh, proper order to for us as uh, like not getting involved like an onlooker? Like what should a proper order, order to for us? Uh, uh, the, were you asking me if when wars break out in different countries around the world, what should we do as Americans? Well, can you pose this as a specific Genway question for this particular film? Let, let's let's narrow this down a little bit. Um, maybe we can come back to you with a more specific question, uh, unless um, you. We, so um, I'd like to keep the focus on this film. Um. So we can. Why don't you give it some thought, and we can come back to you. Oh. Okay. Okay. So Mariah, would you like to ask your question? I did have two of them, but I think the one that I was most interested in is um, you did comment about the media's um, coverage of these topics. And I just wanted to know uh, like what you think of the lack of awareness that the media has um, for what's going on in Armenia. You mean what, what? What was what was the reason that they didn't cover it? And if they did, it was inaccurate. Yeah, like what do you what do you feel about it? And then what was the reason? Like what do you feel like the reason is? I suppose. Um, I think it's been a, a a total media fail. It, it continues to be, and and there are several reasons. Uh, one of them, as I as I lay out in the film, is that Azerbaijan and Turkey, but mainly Azerbaijan for years was preparing for this invasion. And part of their preparation was the, inv the information war that they started years before that, investing millions and millions uh, across Europe and North America in uh, hiring lobbyists and public relations firms and uh, sort of shaping this false narrative. Um, uh, you know, creating these quote unquote strategic partnerships with media companies such as BBC, uh, New York Times, uh, CNN, uh, which you're basically bribing them to only report favorable things about you and to turn a blind eye to, uh, you know, the other side, um, as well as uh, just use um, very biased, 
uh, propaganda-filled uh, reporting. And this was sort of across the board. That was one part of it. Second part was, um, you know, there was an article by a non-Armenian Guardian journalist that uh, compared the invasion of Ukraine, which happened a year and a half after Armenia or Artsakh, uh, and Artsakh, and they're very close geographically. And uh, she went through the different reasons why Ukraine was given this intense attention from day one uh, and aid, uh, you know, including the size of it, the natural um, resources and stuff, and the fact that the enemy was Putin. And she really boiled it down to Armenia wasn't West enough and it wasn't white enough. So that was another part of it. Um, the third is that a lot of, as we know, bigger media companies have ties and uh, associations and such uh, with uh, bigger corporations that do business with Azerbaijan and Turkey, um, which have unlimited money and resources. So it was part of sort of like, let's not, uh, let's sort of keep politics of just politics, you know, for example, uh, you know, British Petroleum, BP, which has huge interests in Azerbaijan, I mean, them and BBC are basically in cahoots. So what would, ex what would you expect BBC to do? Uh, we've, you know, for three years, I've read and watched, um, uh, you know, the most you know, you would you would think it's lazy journalism, but it's not lazy journalism. It's just um, it's just bias, and it's both both sidedism, and it's toxic, false balance of uh, calling Artsakh an enclave and uh, not acknowledging the fact that Armenians of Artsakh have lived there for millennia. Um, just just terrible, terrible. And you know, and, and there's also those that just don't care and they don't do their homework. Um, and you know, we're, we're competing with uh, Azerbaijan, which uh, has these press trips where they take uh, journalists from all over the world to Baku and wine and dine them, put them up in five star, five diamond hotels and Michelin star restaurants. And uh, sort of feed them propaganda at their sort of closing gala and say, now go home and write about it. Uh, we're, they're actually now doing it with influencers. So this is what we're competing with. We're competing with an information war, a propaganda war that Azerbaijan has unleashed. Um, you know, they, they take Armenian churches and they scrape off the Armenian scriptures that have been carved in them. Uh, they were carved in them like fifth, sixth, seventh centuries and call them uh, uh, Albanian Caucasian churches, a civilization long gone and not even in that region or close to where Artsakh is. So it's, media is just terrible, you know? And I know, so there's the last part, which is leadership from our uh, world leaders and our uh, elected officials that feeds media and the media feeds them. So it's kind of a cycle. So when the world leaders didn't take any, uh, leadership in what was happening, the media didn't care either. I mean, to this day, President Biden hasn't said a word about this uh, to this day. So, you know, and yet he has said many, many, many things about Ukraine. And it's okay, of course, we want him to, but why not about Artsakh? So uh, that's where petropolitik comes in, self-interest comes in. Uh, and when you know, if, if President Biden mentions the tiniest thing about Artsakh today, they'll all write about it. So it's one, one thing feeding the other, feeding the other, basically. Thank you very much. And our, the next question here really fits quite well with what we were just talking about, related, what you talk, discussed related to media. Yusuf, would you like to ask your question? This is an yeah. excellent follow-up to what we were talking about. Yeah, so my question was, um, is there a specific source you recommend on research, researching accurate world news, especially since you demonstrated in your film 
I'm sorry, your your his, sound his, comes very gargled. You know what, let me, I, and, and Yusuf, you don't need to turn your camera on because I think you're having audio and vi video problems. But his question is, can you recommend sources? Um, so, you know, how to get information about Artsakh, since the, the bias and the lack of coverage that you were discussing, where would you send particularly students if they want to really know what's happening? Sure. So uh, if uh, I, I have an advocacy nonprofit organization called uh, Truth and Accountability League, you can go to truthandaccountabilityleague.org and go to the media room. And I post uh, uh, the better written articles on there and as well as um, uh, some of the statements by politicians and world leaders and such. As far as media, I think The Guardian um, I think Professor Theron Mkhitaryan can uh, really uh, comment on this too. I think The Guardian has done the best job at reporting. And when I say best job, <laughs> this story is so neglected that if someone just does a decent job, we get excited. And I think Guardian has done pretty good. Forbes has done pretty good. Uh, as far as uh, other sources, Sybilnet.net. Um, is a really good source of just basic facts um, that reports it. Um, there is a, um, a journalist named Lindsay Snell, uh, who I absolutely, absolutely admire. Lindsay is in the middle of it. She gets death threats constantly from Azerbaijanis and Turkish. It, they, they threaten to rape her and do all kinds of stuff to her. She sent me screenshots, they're horrendous. Uh, Lindsay Snell, if you follow her on Twitter, is, is incredible what she um, what she does and what she reports. How do you spell her last name? Uh, Snell, S-N-E-L-L. -L. Okay, and thank Lindsay you. Lindsay is L-I-N-D-S-E-Y. Right, thank you. She's American, um, but she's on the she's on the ground and she's uh, absolutely um, fantastic. Also. Uh, if you follow Baroness Cox on her social media, uh, Baroness Cox is uh, really has a lot of great things to say um, about what happens. Um, you know, there's there's some there's some that um, are doing this work. There's also um, uh, Uze Bulut, who is a actually a Turkish journalist that lives in Israel. Uh, she does a re really good job of, of reporting about all of this. Uzay Bulut, if you follow her on Twitter, um, that's a really good person. Well, thank you very much. Um, so man, uh, let's see, Dr. Kuhn, would you like to ask your question? Okay. Um, yeah, I have actually several questions. Um, you stated that um, Azerbaijan uh, was preparing preparing for the war for 10, 11 years. Uh, are you stating that in retrospect? And if so, um, and if not, uh, my question would be, why didn't Armenia and Artsakh foresee and be better prepared? I don't understand what you mean in retrospect. Well, you are talking about, um, you know, you film this today and you go back to events in the past. Um, so, and you say they were preparing the war for the war, and you assembled all those elements. Uh, if you were able to assemble them, wh uh, why did not Armenia and Artsakh look at those two and prepare for such a terrible invasion? Um, honestly, uh, you know, I can write a book about just that one question, but here's the bottom line. Uh, Armenia is a, is a nation of 2.9 million people. Uh, Turkey has a population of 80 million. Azerbaijan has 10 million. Azerbaijan is one of the biggest producers of oil and gas, which means it's one of the wealthiest nations in the region. Turkey is a NATO ally. Um, there was no way for Armenia to uh, prepare for this kind of 
uh, an invasion or compete. Uh, because you have to also remember, it wasn't just Azerbaijan and Turkey. Uh, this was done with uh, bringing mercenaries, hired mercenaries, as I said, from Syria, Libya, and Pakistan. And the weaponry that Azerbaijan was able to buy from several countries, um, including Israel, uh, it was so much more sophisticated and powerful than what Armenians could have had. So this wasn't, uh, this wasn't something that uh, anyone can compete with. Even now, what we know, Armenia doesn't have oil or gas or uh, any significant amount of natural resources to be able to raise that kind of money for um, that kind of military. I mean, Azerbaijan just bought just under $2 billion worth of weapons from Israel. So... Armenia's GDP is about just over $2 billion. Yeah. Um, and I have another question. Um, who has seen the film? Who has seen the film? Yeah. Is it? Means, but, uh, it's been in 76 film festivals as an official selection. It's won 39 awards. Uh, we had an LA premiere last July, the Raleigh Studios, Hollywood. We had a, um, a screening uh, sponsored by the mayor of Glendale, Senator Portentino and assembly member Friedman. Uh, I premiered the film in Armenia in September, then premiered it in Canada, Toronto in November. Uh, oh, we also had a congressional screening in DC in September and a Philadelphia screening. Um, and I'm going to South Korea at the end of May for a human rights film festival. And what was the reaction of the reason I'm asking is because I wanted to make sure there were not only people like you and I watching it, but also politicians. And that yeah. brings my question to what was the reaction? I noticed you had local politicians, you know, from Southern California. You also had mostly de Democrats. Uh, well, that's not true. So, that's, I I interviewed seven members of Congress in the film. There was uh, only one council member there, and that was Paul Koretz. But I'm talking about most of the people were Democrats. They were not Republicans. So my question yeah. is: You showed it to the congressional, you know, to the to Congress. What was their reaction on both sides of the aisle? Well, let me let me tell you about the Democrats, Republican things. To me, this issue has got is not partisan. It's not about Republicans or Democrats. Um, I was not able to secure any Republican um, interview. I I really wanted to interview some Republicans. Uh, there are several Republican uh, members of Congress in the Armenian Congressional Caucus. Um, I couldn't get an interview for that with them uh, for whatever reason. Uh, so that's the reason for that. I think. Uh, uh, we have, we definitely have Republican allies on this issue. So that was that. As far as the feedback about the film, it's been, you know, with the risk of sounding uh, uh, pr too proud, is uh, it's been really incredible. People have um, said nothing but really um, nice things about the film and the need and how com comprehensive it is. As I said, I made it for non-Armenians, so I've had non-Armenians walk up to me and said, you made a very complicated issue very simple to follow, and that's a big compliment. Um, it's been, a, it's been a, you know, it's bittersweet because this is a film that I wish I didn't have to make. So when people compliment you, you think, okay, I guess it's good. It's good. The message is getting out. Um, you know, and when you get emails or messages on social media from people who watched it, because now that the film is released, it's on, you know, it's on Vimeo. Uh, it's uh, it's really nice to get this kind of a feedback from people. How about congressional reactions? Um, well, I think for the most part, <laughs> members of Congress have uh, kept their uh, feedback very discreet because uh, the film uh, talks about a lot of things that uh, that is not basically what our official State Department stance is, right? Um, I'm not gonna mention who, but 
a leading member of Congress asked to meet with me privately when I was in DC. So that kind of gives you a, an idea of the reality of what's happened. And we have all these members of Congress know what's happened and talk about it, but yet they have to sort of officially on paper or publicly, they have to go with what the State Department, uh, State Department uh, claims or stands for. So when I was in, uh, when I premiered the film in Armenia, I invited uh, Ambassador Lynn Tracy, who was the ambassador at the point, and I knew she wasn't going to come, but I did it anyway, because I knew that she would not want to her presence there uh, to validate <laughs> Uh, what the U.S. government is having such a hard time uh, accepting and validating the, the obvious. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Samantha, I think we've addressed part the second part of your question, but would you like to make your comment about the film? Um, yeah, give me one second. Um, so just to kind of go off of what Carla said initially in um, the conversation, um, I noticed like heavy narration and I was just wondering if there was something that inspired you to execute the film that way. Um, ask, ask, ask it again. Um, about um, yeah, of course. Um, so Carla talked about um, the way that you approached the film with heavy narration and the way that you presented information and just interviews. I was wondering if there's anything that inspired that. Well, I wouldn't say inspired. What I would say is I had to put the, the objective, right? So what's the narration going to do? First and foremost, given that most people would not even know anything about Artsakh or what it is, where it is, I have to give a uh, background and, and uh, uh, you know, context and really get people to know in the briefest kind of time about that. And then really walk them through this, right? So like tell the story of like, here is Artsakh, this is where we were, this is what's happened, this is the years of uh, uh, Armenophobia and ethnic cleansing of Armenians and uh, the Pan-Turkic ambitions. And then, uh, and, and, and then go from there. Of course, in the film, I wanted to balance it between, you know, as a journalist, you're very tempted to be very fact heavy and sort of go super detailed and then just go on and on about something. Then you have to like cut it because it's just not possible. Um, but then I also wanted the stories to really speak for themselves too, highlighting the veterans and the refugees and eyewitnesses and such. And um, the way I interviewed the, the veterans, uh, I, was, I was very flattered and surprised how open they were. And I think ultimately, uh, if the word star can really be appropriate for this film, but they're the ultimate stars, the, the, the four veterans and how personal they got, right? So I wanted to show, uh, to balance between facts uh, journalism, uh, but also personal stories. Um, and also, of course, I tied in a little bit of my own to show intersectionality, shared trauma. And I also talked about other genocides to show, again, intersectionality and shared trauma. Thank you. And before I go to the next question, I just want to say, Samantha, you had a really nice comment. She she thanked you for being here. She said, I really enjoyed your film and appreciated how in depth you were about the subject. So thank you for your kind words and your question, Samantha. Um, I believe Tom Zenda has a question. Uh, I do. Yes. Thank you, Mary. I should say thank you, Dr. Hussein. Okay. Um, Fine. I, I will address this uh, to the director. And um, uh, I had been thinking of uh, possible parallels uh, between what's going on in Ukraine versus Russia and what's happening in Arksan uh, versus Azerbaijan. Um, in Ukraine, uh, apparently, from what I've read, there uh, is a lot of cross cultural connection. Uh, many Ukrainians speak Russian, they have close relatives in Russia, and so forth. 
uh, there's intermarriage. And I wondered if there's uh, anything like that between Arksan oh, and um, Azerbaijan, uh, since they have been, uh, the territories and the people have been uh, on each other's borders for, for centuries. That's well, not really for centuries. Azerbaijan as a sovereign nation has been around since 1991 when it uh, regained its independence from the Soviet Union in 1991. By the way, months after Artsakh declared itself uh, uh, an independent state. <clears throat> As a territory, Azerbaijan was formed in 1918 by the Soviets to gather nomadic people. And two years later, it was folded into the USSR. So Azerbaijan is a 32-year-old nation. I mean, that's just fact. Uh, in fact, I, I talk about in the league, you know, in the film, the League of Nations uh, refused to call Azerbaijan uh, a nation, the League of Nations being the predecessor of the UN, because there were no clear borders and there were all kinds of people living in it. And it was very chaotic and parts of it uh, belonged to the Persian Empire. So, uh, so in that sense, no. The other part is, you know, in in history of, uh, in the last four or 500 years, uh, since the Ottoman Empire, um, uh, and of course, most importantly, pre-genocide with, uh, with the Ma Adana massacres, 1896 and on, uh, there have been a lot of uh, Turkish uh, invasions and uh, Turks uh, killing the husbands and the men and stealing the women a lot of times the pretty women and the kids and Turkifying them and forcing them to turn to or convert to Islam. So that has happened. In fact, there's a really good book called Hidden Armenians. That's about a lot of Armenians in Turkey today um, that are, you know, for several generations, they've lived in hiding or they were, you know, their grandmother was Armenian and uh, uh, was forced to marry a Turk, and uh, now they've found out that, that they have Armenian roots and stuff like that. So there are a lot of similar similarities between uh, Russia's invasion, invasion of Ukraine and uh, Azerbaijan's invasion of Artsakh, um, and then some uh, not as much. It's, uh, uh, you know, for example, Ukrainian is a much closer language to Russian. But Armenian is not a very close language to uh, tur Turkish. And Azerbaijan is essentially a different sort of type of Turkish as a language. Oh, hold on. Go ahead. What? Thank you. I did. Oh, I was going to say thank you very much. And uh, thank you again for this really, really informative film. Thank you. I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Um, Garrett, Garrett has a good question. Um, Garrett, would you like to ask your question? Garrett Rose? Absolutely. Uh, let me find it. It's at 5.30 on the chat. Um, I said, uh, what is the biggest takeaway you desire for viewers to have after watching the documentary? Well, I, I would say there's two. The, the one, the first one is, seems a little selfish, but then again, no. First one is I want people to know that for ever since December 12th, right? So it's been over three months, uh, 120,000 Armenians have been, uh, are, have been in, in an open air prison because Azerbaijan has blocked the only road that leads from Artsakh to Armenia. Um, very high altitude, super cold, freezing temperatures, no medicine or food going in, 30,000 of them are kids. Uh, Azerbaijan uh, uh, plays psychological warfare on them. They shoot through the borders all the time, cut off gas, electricity, uh, internet, so part of the takeaways, I want everyone, hey, I'll be blunt. I want everyone to talk about it. 
tell someone, talk to your uh, local officials, talk to write to somebody. So that's that's one takeaway. The second takeaway is is a little bit more global and that you know, Armenians have struggled to get the world to recognize the Armenian genocide for, you know, we're about to commemorate the 108th anniversary. Uh, it wasn't until 2021 that, that the U.S. recognized the Armenian genocide, at least the president um, did. 30 plus nations have, lots have not. And this is a perfect example that if you do not uh, recognize genocide, and hold to account the perpetrators uh, and seek justice, that these sorts of things will happen over and over again. And it's not just Artsakh, it's happening now in Ethiopia, it's happening in Yemen, it's happening in different parts of the world. Um, and also for people to really think, why do we react so strongly to one type of people being slaughtered or killed, and yet we ignore others. So hopefully this film um, starts conversations like that, and we really look at our own uh, foreign policy uh, and say, okay, if we're not going to, you know, if we're not the world's police, then let's not police anyone. But why do we police these people or help these people and ignore others. So it has to do with our own self-interest. The reason the US is not doing anything and letting Armenians of Artsakh get killed or just Armenians is because US interests. US has a lot more interest and that interest is with uh, alliance with Azerbaijan and Turkey and, and others and others. So um, there's a, you know, I always tell people this film at the very core of it isn't really about Armenians or Artsakh or Armenia. It's about freedom, human rights, and a right to self-determination, which is universal. Thank you very much. Um, I'm skipping to the bottom here of the questions. Linda, um, would you like to make your comment and ask your question, a community member this yeah. joined us? Thank you, thank you. So um, thank you so much, Vic. I really appreciate this. and. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I saw this movie when it was at the ARPA Film Festival online. Mm -hmm. And then when I rewatched it this week, there was a bit about Ukraine. And I thought, did he add that? And then if so, I'm curious to know why you added the part about Ukraine. I did. Yeah, no, I mean, the good uh, ob observation as we were editing this film is when Ukraine happened. And of course, you think, okay, the invasion of Artsakh happened with Putin's blessing, right? I mean, so much self-interest there. Russia really had a big win in all of this. Uh, we can't prove it, and I, we, don't, we don't know what would have happened, but what if Artsakh had gotten a lot of attention? What if the world and the U.S. had reacted to the invasion of Artsakh the way they did with Ukraine? Would, would Russia have dared to go to Ukraine? Hey, I'm just asking a question. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Because this, this is, you know, it's so similar and there are so many parallels and such. So one uh, always wonders. Thank, thank you for your question and for joining us, Linda. Um, Santiago, would you like to ask your question? Um, honestly, I feel like my question is in a way already kind of answered, just judging by everything that we've sort of talked about. Um, okay. yeah, it generally just talks on accountability. Right. Um, I guess more specifically following the money trails that, um, were uncovered in the whole money laundering system that they had going on. Um, and like how it was discovered by the same people or the group that did the uh, Pandora Papers. I don't remember the exact name, but it was basically, yeah, just accountability CRP. of high level executives and all that and the lobbying firms. But it's kind of, it follows the same trends that we've already talked about. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Vanessa, would you like to ask your question? Um, yeah, sorry, my camera's not working, but um, I just wanted to know how you would say that your experiences growing up influenced how exactly you told the story. I know you've touched on this a lot throughout this Q&A, but I don't know if you had anything more to add or anything um, you wanted to say about that. Yeah, um, you know, um, so I, um, so I'm Armenian by blood, uh, my parents, everyone, uh, my ancestors were forcibly relocated to Iran in the early 1600s uh, by another sort of a invasion. And so I was born in Iran and I remember growing up and always feeling different, out of place uh, for several reasons. Part of it was, uh, you know, there was a difference between us, Ar the Armenian, the small Armenian Christian community in Iran and then the rest, rest of Iran, right? We were ethnically different, but we're also different because of ethnicity. And that became even more obvious after the Iranian revolution of 79, when the Islamic government took over. So that sense of like, I don't 100% belong here. I'm looked at as an outsider was there. Of course, the fact that I was gay, which at the time I didn't know what that meant, but I just knew I was different and felt really sort of confused. And so then when I was 12, I moved to Greece. And of course in Greece, I love the Greeks, Greeks and Armenians are cousins, but we were still, I still felt like an outsider. I wasn't Greek, right? So I was still like, not intentionally, but you're a second class citizen. I moved here uh, uh, at 15 and we know America and, and how much focus there is on race and religion and ethnicity and all of that. So again, I, don't, I feel like, although I feel, I feel that LA is home and like, this is it for me and I love it. And uh, sometimes I actually even forget that I'm not like, I wasn't born here, but I am reminded once in a while that I am still different. I'm an outsider. So why am I telling you this? Because when you grow up and there's not one place that you can ever feel that you're a hundred percent, you really hold on to what your roots are. And, and my roots being Armenian. So when these types of attacks happen, it's very, it's waking up trauma, especially knowing that there was also an Armenian genocide where they literally tried to exterminate Armenians from the face of the planet, you know? So it, it, it just hits you really hard. It's, it's like a wound that never healed and then someone pours acid on top of it. So in my film, I kind of briefly talk about that, that talk, that, that sense of not belonging, that sense of uh, feeling that the oppressed and the disfranchised, that, that, uh, that when you feel like that, you also feel act like an activist. You just sort of don't have an option then, well, you do, but you, for me, I had to become an activist because Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it, the film was influenced a little bit with my own personal experiences too, for sure. Thank you very much. That's really, it's very interesting to hear more about your background. I just have a very quick question based on what you just shared. Do you still have family in Iran? Because I knew that there were quite a few. Um, I, I have, I believe a cousin, but everyone's oh, okay. left. Got it. Everyone's pretty much left. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, the, after the 1979 revolution, right. Armenians really had a big exodus. Sure. Thank you. Um, I've been looking through the question, and most of these questions we've addressed um, in the context of other questions. Is there anybody who'd like to ask something that um, you know we haven't addressed? I'm, gonna, I'm asking if I missed something that you'd like to ask. Um, let, well, then let me, um, 
go to Professor Dermogadici and do you have any questions or comments for our guest director? No, I think uh, I think the last question was kind of the one that I wanted to ask is is to to really talk about how uh, his background, his growing up, formed mm -hmm. his worldview, and then how that affected uh, making the the video. So, uh, just congratulate him on the effort and uh, you know making a film that that is important. And you we have to speak about things, and you know people are saying asked questions about how do we how do we deal with wars in other countries, right? And we're here in America and we're not directly in the war, but how should we act or what are our attitudes? Well, you have to speak up. You have to try to influence those people who do make a difference. And, and as Vic said, if you, if you don't do it, you really, you really do see it happening again and again. And that's really the, the, where we're living, right? And in our world is that we see that every few years something pops up because People forgot about it, didn't address it, didn't resolve it, and then it, it pops up again. And for Armenians, this is especially true uh, because of the Armenian genocide. And then uh, the Republic of Armenia and the wars of Artsakh. Uh, and again, we seem to be back in square one, where it seems to be from an Armenian perspective that you can kill Armenians um, and do it without any, any responsibility or any punishment. And that's that's particularly um, hurtful. So I think the film illustrates all of those things. So that's that's all I would say. Uh, and, and again, thank you for for that's Vic for sharing that. So, see, would you like to make a comment, so see, uh yes, Thank you for yes. joining us. Yes, I would like to do that. First off, Vic, um, I commend you for this beautiful film that you have done. Like um, Barlow said, it needs to be heard. And uh, as a daughter of two genocide survivors, my father was an orphan who grew up in Lebanon. My mom from Kilis, they were lucky. Her family, they walked across the Syrian border. So um, I grew up listening and hearing all these horror stories of how people were actually killed. And watching this film was very emotional for me. Some of the things would bring back all these stories and the, you know, visuals that I've had. Uh, so I thank you for doing this. And we need to get the word out. Um, if I had a question for you, uh, it would be, have you received any negative reaction to your work? And can you comment a little bit about those drones that everybody talked about? Uh, first of all, thank you, Sosi, for sharing your personal story. Um, I'm trying to think about any negative feedback. You know, um, nothing to really highlight. Uh, there was a, one that comes into mind. I don't know if it was a neg negative feedback is, we screened a film at Glendale College and a gentleman got up and said, uh, you know, he was pretty angry. He said, why didn't you cover the mistakes that the generals made, the Armenian generals, in defending the nation and this and that? And I kind of knew where he was going. And so I've kept politics within Armenia completely out of this film intentionally. This was not the film for it. I'm not interested. Doesn't mean I don't have my opinions. This isn't the for it. So I didn't touch anything having to do with internal Armenian politics. If Armenian people want to make a film about that, all the power to them. So uh, I, that's what I told them. I said, this isn't the venue. This isn't the film. This is, this is I'm not going to take focus away from the fact that two genocidal nations with help with the several other genocidal nations are trying to exterminate Armenians by focusing on what mistakes, what few mistakes were made on our side. Who doesn't? So uh, I think, I guess that that would be a negative thing uh, because you know he had his own agenda <laughs> and it didn't align with my agenda, which is telling the truth about uh, what happened. But no, it's been, it's been, uh, it's been, uh, a, a very positive um, experience. I've just been really um, 
grateful and thrilled to go through film festivals and uh, get the feedback, um, emails and, and, and such from different people. Uh, as, far as, as far as the drones are concerned, the drones were the, they were the deal breakers for them to win because uh, they had such sophisticated drones um, that, uh, you know, a set of drones would come and monitor and find uh, Armenian targets and the other one would come and, 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 uh, and bomb. So um, the drones were definitely uh, the sort of what really made them do this, help them for the most part. Thank you. Thank you. And I know we said we'd wrap up at 6.30, so I'm just looking really quickly. Um, most of the questions we have covered. Vanessa, you have a really nice thank you comment. Would you like to share it? Would you like to um, verbalize what you wrote? Yeah, I just, you know, thank you for sharing your story and your perspective. I could definitely relate to your comment about, you know, hanging on to your roots when you feel out of place. Like, for me, I'm a Mexican-American queer woman. So, yeah, it's just amazing the work that you've done. So thank you so much. Thanks, Vanessa. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And, and if I missed an, a, another question, I apologize, but we were trying to wrap up around 630. So, uh, but I just want to thank you for your courage, Vic, and your determination. And you've done so much to raise awareness about what's happening. And um you know, one voice, you're an example, one voice can make a difference. Thank so, you. and you share the voices of so many people in your film. And I want to thank you for joining us for this screening. Uh, I'd li also like to thank Professor uh, Barla de Mergadichian for your longtime collaboration. And I look forward, we're already plotting future Armenian themed films for next year. So uh, exactly. we have a couple of really excellent ones. I won't give it away, but we have a couple of excellent ones on uh, that I think we're going to be able to book. So and bring the directors in person next year. Um, so, but thank you so much for joining us and for your thoughtful questions and response. And it's always an honor and a pleasure to co uh, to collaborate with Professor Demergadichian. Thank You're you. doing an incredible thank job you. raising awareness about Armenia and the heritage and culture in our own community and beyond. So thank you so very much. So students, you're free to go. Community members, thank you for joining us. Put your hands together and thank Armenian Studies and Vic Germani for sharing his film and discussion with us.